Welcome, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something or possibly nothing. That depends on one's point of view and how far they've decided to explore this. Another question that might even arise, too, is does God exist, and if so, is it necessary? On the program today, we're going to be followed with a wonderful guest who is a foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and the Physics Department at Arizona State University. He is also co-director of the Cosmology Initiative and inaugural director of the Origin Project. On the program today, he's going to be talking about his book, A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Something Rather Than Nothing. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program our guest, Mr. Lawrence M. Cross. Lawrence, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. Hi, it's a pleasure to be on. Or thank you for not joining us. (laughs) Yeah. You choose. (laughs) I really enjoy this particular discussion because I think it's one that's so necessary, especially for the evolution of the human spirit. Because there comes a time where you feel like you're stuck, the answers sort of implode on each other from what we know to a point of frustration to where you have to burst and expand into a whole different realm of thinking, and there you find all new answers. That must have been what the journey must have been like for you growing up. Well, uh, I guess I got inspired to think about science uh, and the universe for two different reasons. Uh, uh, first, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> and so she convinced me that doctors were scientists. And by the time I found out doctors weren't, it was, it was too late. But also, when I was a kid, from the time I was pretty young, I read books by scientists. Um, I remember reading a book about Galileo, and then I read books by Einstein and and George Gamow, and, 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 and those, I found it inspiring. I just found that, that search amazing. And, and that's one of the reasons why I write books now. It, uh, it's a, one of the most satisfying things for me is when I've been writing long enough that when people come up to me and say, you know, I read your book when I was a kid, and it made me want to do science. And I, I just, uh, now I don't want to turn everyone into scientists, but, but what I want to do is offer everyone the option of discovering how amazing our universe really is. And yeah. that's the purpose of the new book. Yeah, and there's no doubt about it, but I'm sure that as you write or you're out there and you are talking about this, and as I understand, it was actually a YouTube video uh, produced which has more than a million views uh, showing your lectures. So there's certainly a lot of curiosity and I'm certain a lot of debate as well as conversation over what you've produced. Yeah, no, in fact, well, I, the book was motivated when I, when I realized the incredible response to that lecture, which was which shocked me. And... Um, uh, uh, it, it indeed it, uh, it's 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 clearly a topic that that has captured people's imaginations and 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 that's why with, with each of my books in some sense I, I want to if, if, if you wish say you have a hook that that allows people to really get motivated to think about things and this the hook is this is this fascinating question why is there something rather than nothing that's been at the heart of religious belief and I get countered by that a lot when I talk and I and uh, and I wanted to show the uh, remarkable developments in cosmology that have changed what we mean by something and nothing and also made it clear that it's more and more plausible that the universe itself began from nothing. And, uh, um, but, you know, I think most people are interested in science without, without necessarily knowing they're interested in science. I wish more media knew. There's an incredible thirst. And when, when people get, once they get hooked, it's, it's insatiable. And, and, and a lot of the times people don't even know they're interested in science. Um, they may be interested in time travel or black holes and, and, um, and and I think at heart we're all scientists. At heart we always ask the same questions about how we got here, where we're going. And and unfortunately in the school systems we tend to beat it out of students. But but I think people invariably are fascinated and should be fascinated about about their place in the cosmos. You know I couldn't agree with you more. I remember years ago as I was growing up, one t- at one point my mother decided to say that she was a self-proclaimed atheist. And I found that mm-hmm. kind of curious as a kid growing up because I thought, well, you know, you kind of made me go to church on Sundays. What was that all about? And she says, well, I at least wanted you exposed to religion and and this God stuff. But the reason that she felt that she was an atheist is she says, I just can't put myself or wrap myself around a God who would create the idea of sin, the idea that humans would be punished because we're born into sin. Well, what about animals and babies? Now, well, that's an interesting point of view, but that actually took me in directions just pondering that particular thought in ways that I would never imagine. For instance, as a kid growing up, I'm sure you might have remembered uh, Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom. 
So you yep. start watching animal documentaries, and then you find over the years of science and the ability to film increased in the animal and plant kingdoms, you started realizing the ideal of symbiosis, that so one is created, another comes along, and it becomes food for the other. So you basically come to a zero point. And I thought, boy, this gets more and more fascinating as you look into it. And it's the same way with our creation, it seems like. Well, in a, in a way, absolutely. I, mean, mm-hmm. I think the thing is that the universe is the, the amazing thing, and that for some people the frightening thing is that the universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. And the things we might li- like or not like about it, but it doesn't matter whether we like it or don't like it. it that's the way it is. And, and, and we have to confront that, not just intellectually, but in our lives. And in fact, mm-hmm. we, need to con- we need to confront that to meet the challenges of the 21st century. You know, I do cosmology and and particle physics fields that are relatively esoteric, but I'm also quite interested in, in public policy in, in this country. And, 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 and uh, one of the things that's most important for me is that in order, to, in order to meet these challenges we face, we have to look at the universe and the world head on. We can't live in myths and, and fairy tales if we're going to really <laughs> create public policy that's going to, that's going to improve our lives in the future. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to uh, quote from your book here, which is actually in your epilogue, and I'm just kind of curious how this has played out for you. It says here, I find oddly satisfying the possibility that in either scenario, even a seemingly omnipotent God would have no freedom in the creation of our universe, no doubt because it further suggests that God is unnecessary or at best redundant. What has that been like for you out there with something like that? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, some people have reacted strongly because, um, and, and, and you know, the funny thing is, I'm, I'm brand. It, it, when you make a statement like that, I'm trying to make it clear that this is a possibility, right. a possibility that I find attractive. But, but I'm not proclaiming that this is necessarily the way it happened. But immediately, people, people. The problem with the religion is, is you have the answers before you ask the questions, in some sense, and and and. And there's certainty about issues that you can't be certain about. And one of the things I want to make quite clear is that I'm presenting a plausibility case, just as, in some sense, you know, before Darwin, life was a miracle in every way. You couldn't, everything looked designed for its, for, for its environment and its uh, function. And Darwin showed amazingly that by natural processes of mutation and natural selection, we could produce the diversity of life on Earth. And, and at the time, it was plausible, and then it became firmer and firmer, and we don't understand right now the exact origin of life. It's one of the things we, we're, we're studying at the institute that I run here. And, but we do believe that it's plausible that, that chemical reactions will turn into biological ones ultimately. And we th- I think prob- probably in the next decade we'll know how that happens. And what, what, I, what, what is amazing to me is we, we've now seen by the revolutions in cosmology that, that it's plausible by a series of natural mechanisms that the universe could come into being. Now, and, and so I'm just, uh, you know, that plausibility is what's important, but it's amazing that the reaction, the counter-reaction is, no, we know that didn't happen. And how can you know something about that? And, and, the, and then, of course, the assumption is made that I'm somehow claiming that science knows everything, and I'm just going to find out what, what's possible. And I think it's, and, and the great thing about science, in some sense, is that it, our faith is shakeable. Mm-hmm. We can believe something to be true, and then... And then uh, if the evidence shows otherwise, we throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. We're not, we're, not, we're not held to beliefs that have been around for thousands of years, developed by people who didn't even know the earth went around the sun. Mm-hmm. I think one of the more interesting questions, too, is you get to a point that you say, I'm going to go on faith until science proves it, which keeps things in the exploration alive, it seems like. Well, yeah, well, I think, the, I mean, what do you, it's a question of what do you mean by faith? I mean, scientists have faith in some sense that the universe is comprehensible, but, but um, uh, uh, it's, it, it is, it, the, the, the real problem is when your faith uh, is inconsistent with the results of science, and then, and then for some people, for them, they'd rather throw out the science. And even, even the religious scholars for thousands of years said, look, you know, and Moses Maimonides said, you know, as he put it, the scriptures are actually absolutely true. But if the results of science are disagreement with the scriptures, you better change you, with your interpretation of the scriptures. You better change your interpretation. And the point is that you you don't want to mess with Mother Nature. And and if 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 your beliefs are inconsistent with the evidence of reality, it amazes me that many people would rather be ignorant or that their children be ignorant than somehow 
cause them to re- reassess their faith. Uh, you know, the, the, the reaction against evolution in this country is amazing. There are people who don't want their children to learn evolution, or to learn modern biology, because they'd rather them not know how the world works than, 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 than risk the possibility that some aspect of their faith would be threatened. Now, I've, I've pointed out in, in, um, in many places that you don't have to be an atheist to believe in evolution. You certainly don't have to be an atheist to do cosmology. There, there, the, the, you, what happened, happened, and how you interpret it uh, is, is up to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, the point is that the Big Bang really happened, whether you like it or not. Evolution really happened, whether you like it or not. And if you want to, if you want to, if we want a generation of children who are trained to be able to deal with the technological problems and, and challenges of the 21st century, we better make sure we educate them as, as well as possible and not shield them from knowledge. Mm-hmm. It's like the Taliban. You, you don't want to shield people from knowledge. It's the worst thing you can do. And, and my, in my opinion, the more we know, even, even knowing that the universe may exist without purpose or meaning should not make us feel that our lives are meaningless. We create purpose in our own lives. We, 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 it is amazing that we are here on this random planet around a random star in the middle of nowhere, but we've, we have developed a consciousness that allows us to appreciate our place in the cosmos, enjoy it, and, and in fact manipulate our environment. We should make the most of our brief moment in the sun. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. I remember many years ago when I was talking with uh, uh, astrophysicist uh, Ken Croswell out of Harvard University uh, on mm-hmm. Magnificent Universe, and I and you take a look at the chaos that happens, you know, in galaxies, and he was describing even the particular styles of galaxies, and I, I think one of them was an elliptical galaxy, what, which wasn't considered to be as highly ordered as the one we live in, which is a spiral galaxy, so there's order to that. He says, in here there's collisions, there's destruction, there's chaos, and he says, you know, kind of feel thankful we're in a, a more orderly galaxy where, you know, things can be somewhat predictable. But he says, isn't that the interesting thing is there's still galaxies, it's just one seems to be different from the other. Can you be thankful that you have the time to ponder what your meaning is in life, whereas you may be in one of these other galaxies where your planet's there today and gone tomorrow? And and we may ask, why are we on this planet rather than that one? And the simple answer is if we were on that one, we wouldn't, we wouldn't survive. We wouldn't have and, the time to ponder it. Right? It's, it's kind, of a, kind of a cosmic natural selection. Mm-hmm. And, but, I, but at the same time, what's amazing, and I talk about it in the book, is that even cosmic catastrophes can be vital for our existence. Mm-hmm. We are here. You are, you are a star child in a, in a literal way. Every atom in your body has experienced the most violent explosion in nature. I'm not talking about the Big Bang, but, but the, in, the, in the modern universe, because, in fact, the elements that make up your body, the only elements that are made in, in the Big Bang are hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. But the real things that matter for your body, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, those weren't created in the Big Bang. They were only created in the cores of stars, the fiery nuclear furnaces of the cores of stars. And the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. Mm-hmm. And so, and then blew out that stuff. And so are there atoms in your body that came from one star in, a, in your left hand and atoms in your right hand that came from another star. But you're, you, they've literally been part of a stellar explosion. Stars explode once every 100 years per galaxy. So there have been about 200 million stars that have exploded in, in our galaxy, and, and, and I guess as a, a throwaway line in, my, in, my, in the video that has become so popular, I put it, I said, forget Jesus, the stars died, so you'd be born. <laughs> yeah, I know uh, as I was reading your chapter, you were talking about how all of us are essentially star children. I was reminded of a time that I was with uh, a friend of mine at, uh, her, at their house, and her husband, uh, I guess the hobby that he had was painting. And I sat there just mesmerized by a particular painting that he did. And eventually I asked her, I said, uh, can I buy that from him? And she said, no, unfortunately, he's already sold it. And basically all it was, it was an evening scene where you're panned at a tabletop. And what you see is this tabletop. It's obviously the evening. The candle's been blown out. You're seeing through a window seal, okay? There's a bottle of wine with an empty glass and one that's partially empty. So you can guess that, you know, there's an encounter going on. And through the window, see what you see in the background are some distant stars, but then one that seems to be closer to the window. And I thought at the moment that's the immaculate conception. Here's a star coming in, and here's a couple after finishing some wine. I thought, what an interesting way to think about life just based on that alone. <laughs> well, you know what, and actually, but the point you're making, I, I would even extend further. You, one can get inspired by art, but in my opinion, 
one can be inspired by science. And one of the great virtues of science is it's a cultural activity. The point of what I do, some people say, well, what's the point of studying this stuff? The point is not that it's going to make a better toaster, but rather that it changes our perspective of our place in the cosmos. It causes us to think about ourselves, just the same as great art and literature. Science should inspire people. And, 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 and some of the most amazing concepts and most creative ideas that humans have ever come up with are scientific ones, and we owe it to people to expose them to that because it's part, it's part of the joy of being human. As I say, just like a great symphony or a great painting or, 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 or even good rock music. Now, in here you also explore, too, so people really start to understand also the science of how we've gotten to understand things the way that they do. But a lot of this stuff over time was challenged because we were so fixed, for instance, on Newton's law of things, and then eventually it was, you know, Einstein came along, changed that, but then that was even changed as well. So it seems to be, you know, an evolving conversation, you know, certainly based on discovery. And and, and it seems like it's even going to go further. How do you see this all going? Because you also pose the question, as so the universe begins, that it might end. What would that be like? Well, you know, I think I've been thinking a lot about the future of the universe. Everything has changed Mm -hmm. in our view about the future because of one of the most remarkable discoveries in cosmology that also motivated my lecture and motivated the book, and that is, that the dominant energy of the universe resides in empty space. Empty space. You take all the radiation, all the matter out of space, and it weighs something. That is one of the biggest mysteries in science. But it turns out that that energy is gravitationally repulsive. It produces a kind of cosmic anti-gravity, and it's causing the expansion of the universe to speed up, not to slow down. And that changed everything, because in the far future, all the galaxies we now see will be moving away from us faster than the speed of light, and they will be invisible to observers in hundreds of billions of years from now in, our, in what is left of our galaxy. And, the, the, and, the, and it's, kind of, it's kind of poetic that the vision that those, those, in, those beings will have is very similar to the vision we had 100 years ago. 100 years ago, we thought we lived, there was only one galaxy in the universe, the Milky Way, mm-hmm. and it was surrounded by an eternal, empty, static universe. Of course, all that's changed. We now understand there are 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and the universe is expanding. But in the far future, they won't be able to see any of that, and their picture of the universe will return to the, to the quaint one we had 100 years ago. And I think, and, and, but even more than that, after our galaxy goes, it, what, everything we now see in our universe will be cold, dark, and empty. And as my, my friend, uh, the late Christopher Hitchens, who was writing the forward for this book before he passed away, um, uh, said to me when I told him about this, he said, well, you know, nothing is heading towards us as fast as it can. And in some sense, if you think about the, that, the answer to why is there something rather than nothing is just wait, won't be for long. <laughs> you know, one of the things, too, as we talk about the creation of, of us today, you know, is the Big Bang, you know, that from nothing mm-hmm. came something. And I remember as I began to explore Stephen Hawking's, for instance, as he talked mm-hmm. about black holes, that Here's this mass that pulls in pretty much everything around it. It condenses down to this minute amount, but just has this incredible mass within inside of it. Then eventually it has to go somewhere, so it explodes. And I started just, this is what I love about these kinds of conversations, is they get you thinking, what if that's a whole new Big Bang to a whole different universe altogether? Just that black hole, you know. And certainly it makes this very interesting. It it is, and it's actually even more interesting, uh, because, of course, we don't know what will happen in the final stage of black hole evaporation. But one of the amazing things is you can have something from the outside. Because of general relativity, you can have something from the outside. It looks like it's collapsing, but from the inside, it will look like it's expanding. The universe is stranger than science fiction, and that's what's amazing. The universe continues to surprise us the more we study it. And, um, and it's those surprises that make the study of science worthwhile. Because, uh, the, as I often like to say, the, the, the two most favorite states of any theoretical physicist uh, or scientist is are A, either being wrong or confused. And often we're both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing like that. <laughs> now, let's talk about also the possibility, because you look at the miracle of, for instance, us being here, third planet from the sun, balance of yeah. such a huge diversity of life, and you look at 2012, and the conversation about aliens and extraterrestrials, how does that settle in to what we know about the universe at this point? Well, I mean, 
uh, what we well what we have learned in, remarkably is that uh, although I think most of us astrophysicists kind of knew this by, by computer modeling is that most stars have planets around them and in fact there are solar systems that are far more exotic than we thought could ever exist so it's quite likely that in the among the 400 billion or so stars in our galaxy there are four, perhaps 400 billion solar systems maybe 10 times as many planets and when you think about that you realize that the conditions of course that allow for the evolution of life on earth the existence of, of energy from starlight water and organic materials those are ubiquitous but water is, is is ubiquitous sunlight is and we've even discovered on comets rather sophisticated organic molecules so those conditions should be prevalent in many places and if you think about it it's highly suggestive that life of some sort exists elsewhere in the cosmos maybe even in our in our solar system at least microbial life on the uh, Europa and oceans or maybe even under the surface of, of Mars and and then of course the question comes is there intelligent life elsewhere that's a much harder question and of course there are many factors that led to our evolution and it's hard to know how how um, abundant those are how frequent those frequently those factors are recreated but maybe other factors could produce different kinds of intelligence so I'm willing to believe that even if intelligence is extremely rare that there are other intelligences in the universe but but the likelihood unfortunately of us ever knowing about it is very very small because first of all our galaxy is a big place and and moreover how do you know I mean uh, you know I have 200 channels or something on my TV and by the time I find the station I'm looking for it the programs usually over and um, in the real universe there are an infinite number of frequencies to listen to and how do we know what to listen for and moreover we don't know how long civilizations persist uh, the rate we're going it's not clear how long we'll survive and so uh, <laughs> So, so all of these questions come to the fact that, that it's not clear we'll ever know about those our, our cousins elsewhere in the universe. It would be amazing if we did, and, and it doesn't hurt to listen, and I'm happy that we are listening for signals. Mm. But, it, 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 but on the other hand, for people who like to think that we've been visited by aliens, unfortunately the laws of physics tell us it's just too darn hard to travel around the galaxy. It takes too much energy. And you know, you'd have to sort of harness the energy of a star almost to be able to have a spacecraft that goes near the speed of light uh, to visit us, and if it did, you know, I like to say, if you took all of that energy and harnessed all the energy of a star to come down here, it's pretty hard to imagine that you do it just to kidnap psychiatric patients or some Harvard psychiatrist, or for that matter, teenagers, because you're out there on spring break. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, right. uh, there was a point that you had made, or you talked about earlier in the book, and it was interesting. You know, as I read through this, it, it triggered certain uh, areas of my life, you know, growing up and even to this point here. And that's what I love about something like this is even though sometimes you'll get really sort of scientific, I guess, you know, where you're like, oh, goodness gracious, you know, I'm kind of lost here, but I'll read through it. But then something triggers and you kind of go, wow. And uh, you said that uh, the evidence of the Big Bang exists or it used to on your very own TV set. And yeah. I remember the day as a kid when the TVs used to go off the air. You know, now they're 24-7. But when they used to go off the air, you had the little Indian signal, then pretty soon that disappeared and you had nothing but white static. I would find myself, and even sometimes as an adult, if you ever find that, uh, to just be fascinated sitting there looking at it like, when is something going to form itself? When is something going to come through? I don't know if I was just weird as a kid, but, you know, there was a reason I was thinking that, you know, in the first place, because, you know, I didn't know anything about microwaves or, you know, I, we're talking, you know, I'm five, six years old, but I could sit there and watch that stuff for a while. Uh, and, and, and then for you to say, you know, well, you know, there's evidence that's where the Big Bang is. You know, talk about how that came well, up. It, well, it's amazing, because what it turns out that there, that one of, the, one of the greatest discoveries in cosmology that, that confirm the Big Bang really happened is the discovery that there's a uniform background of radiation left over from the Big Bang called the Cosmic Microwave Background. It was discovered by accident in New Jersey, of all places, by two people who didn't know what the heck they were doing. But they won the Nobel Prize anyway. Because they <laughs> yeah, the discovery. guys from Jersey. This is, yeah, this, <laughs> the, the, because in fact this is radiation left over from when the universe was only 100,000 years old. And, and, and one of the predictions of a Big Bang is such a, that such a background should exist, and we've discovered it. And if we can observe it, we can actually see what the universe looked like when it was 100,000 years old, and we've been able to do that. In fact, another Nobel Prize was given for imaging it. But the neat thing is that, in fact, it was right beneath our noses. That If you look at the static on that TV set, that uh, unplug your cable and free yourself, and look at the static, 
about 1% of the static that you were watching that was inspiring you when you were a kid, about 1% of that is actually radiation from the Big Bang. And I found that remarkable. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. But there you go. You can see the beginning of the universe at the end of uh, what you were watching. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Fascinating stuff. Now, what has been some common, I guess, questions people have asked you when they engage in this conversation about what you've written here? Well, I think the question people really have, especially religious people, is, is what do you really mean by nothing? If, you know, and, 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 it's a, and I spend a lot of time in the book trying to explain what I mean by nothing. Uh, I think the traditional definition of nothing is, for, in, in, for early philosophers who even raised this question, was a sort of an infinite empty void, nothing, empty space. And what I show is that even em that empty space is not so empty. It's a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles, and you can actually do the laws of quantum mechanics. Nothing is unstable. Namely, empty space will always produce something by quantum fluctuations. And so, in fact, and it does all the time in your body and elsewhere. And so, so that kind of nothing always produces something. And then people say, well, that's not really nothing because you still have the space. What, where did the space come from? And I say, well, it turns out if you apply quantum mechanics to gravity, then you can create even space from nothing. And, and I talk about that in the book. And, and then people say, well, okay, you know, that's okay. You have no space. You have no math stuff. But, but you still have the laws of physics. You know, who created those? And, and I point out that it's plausible, based on what we know from particle physics and cosmology, that there may be many universes in each of which the laws of physics are different. And the laws themselves could arise spontaneously even as the universe arose. And so even the laws themselves may not be prescribed. And, and I think... I think uh, these kind of address the question of what, what you know, of, of actually what you might mean by nothing. But, but that question, I think, is, is so astounding that I think many people take a lot of time, especially those people who really believe that the question, why is there something from rather than nothing, implies a creator. It takes, uh, there's a lot of pushback to the notion that actually you may not even need an act of intelligent intervention to produce our universe. Hmm. I know that uh, you know that that's been something that's really uh, come right into focus as you were talking about dark energy or zero point energy, and that's something I've uh, come across reading quite a bit about. It seems in the last two years. Uh, describe what that is, because that's kind of what we're talking about with this nothingness. That there really, I guess, in a way, is something. Well, the fact, yeah, I mean, one of the big implications of quantum mechanics combined with relativity is that empty space, can, out of empty space can pop particles called virtual particles that pop in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't even measure them. And that sounds like counting angels on the head of a pin, of course, but it, if you can't measure them, it's not science. But it turns out why you can't measure them directly, we can measure their effects indirectly. And in fact, it's, they're responsible for the properties of atoms, and we can predict their effects, and we compare them with the experiment, and we get answers that agree to one part in 10 billion. They're the best predictions in all science, without the, including the effects of those virtual particles. You get the wrong answer. In fact, most of the mass of your body is due to these virtual particles. And, uh, and so they, they, the empty space is far richer because of the laws of quantum mechanics than we ever would have imagined. It's not science fiction. It's real. Mm. And, of course, uh, it, it can affect not just our bodies but the universe. And I think what's amazing about all of this is when you think about putting, let's just say, God into the equation and that we were made in God's image as co-creators, we certainly see a lot of evidence of how we've co-created. We think something up, and so therefore it's created. And what's been fascinating about the ideal of zero-point energy is you can almost kind of look at that in a way as Aladdin's lamp. So therefore you wish for something, it it becomes real. And you see a lot of this especially in you know, a lot of the movies that are trying to go after the mainstream to explain how physics really works and how we're observers of a created, observer-created reality. And well, it I really starts those, yeah, getting kind of crazy there. It is crazy. I think that, I mean, unfortunately, quantum mechanics has spawned more nonsense than virtually any aspect <laughs> of physics. It's, 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 it's so wild. I mean, the real world is so weird that people get motivated to get even weirder. And what I like to say is the universe is plenty interesting without all the garbage. But the notion that you create the universe by observing it is just not true. And in fact, right. the idea that you could somehow think and want things and cause them to happen elsewhere, is just that's not what quantum mechanics is saying. Quantum mechanics is saying that observers can affect the results of experiments by doing measurements and affecting the system that they're measuring. That, but that's fine. But, but, a system, but you, know, if you, you just can't change the universe by thinking about it. And the universe exists 
<laughs> whether you whether you exist or not. And uh, what I like there's a famous quote from a science fiction writer that I really like is this reality is that which continues to exist even when you stop believing in it. <laughs> uh, thank you for actually pointing that out as far as, you know, how crazy the world is because there were so many people this day and age, you know, and I'm sure that it meant well, but there's the secret. And it was funny because I had a couple of hippie friends when we would kind of visit them. And they, well, you know, it's just like this said as they were sitting there enjoying their recreational use, and they would say, you know, all i got to do is just simply sit here and think about it. And I said, well, how's that working out for you? Because I don't see a whole lot of results. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful stuff here. Again, the book is A Universe from Nothing. Why, there is something rather than nothing. Our guest today, Lawrence M. Krauss. Lawrence, is there a website people can not only find out about your YouTube video, but also uh, more about you? Sure, my website at the university, it's got a long, rather long name, but it's www.krauss.faculty dot asu for arizona state university dot edu and you can read uh, you can read, learn about the book but you can also read uh, my uh, some, my scientific contributions and also articles i've written so you can look there or of course you can always google me people can it's an easy way to find me mr lawrence kraus thank you for joining us here on the beyond 50 radio program thanks it's been a pleasure you bet we also want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. Thank you for tuning in, and remember, live your day past halfway.